This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome everybody um, to the latest ESIP uh, Information Technology and Interoperability webinar. Can't believe it's April 2020. Uh, time flies when you're sitting at home with a two-year-old, uh, or we're chasing a two-year-old at home, I should say. So I hope you all are, are doing well in these wild and crazy, unfortunate times. Um, and we can kind of continue with our, our normal routine as much as possible. Um, this month, um, Julian Chastain from Unidata is coming along to give us a presentation about um, the Unidata Science Gateway, which I had the opportunity to see a demonstration of gosh, last fall, summer, fall time, time when he was really just kind of getting it off the ground and figuring out how it was going to scale up. And we took part in a, um, a little bit of a stress test of it. And I was, I was excited to see this. Um, I think it has a lot in common with some of the stuff that we've seen on the IT and I talks in the past with Pangeo. Um, but it's introducing this idea of a science gateway, which I had not been exposed to until then. Um, and I think is a really really useful paradigm uh, for, for us to be thinking about in a, in a real kind of general way. So with that, I'm excited to hear what you have for us, Julian, and um, go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, David, for that. Uh, okay, hello, everybody. This is Julian Chastain from Unidata, and welcome to this demonstration of the Unidata Science Gateway for this ESIP Interoperability and Technology Teleconference. So just an outline of what we'll be talking about today. I'll start out with some introductory and background material, quite a bit of it. Then we'll do one or more demonstrations of our Jupyter Hub running on the gateway. I'll talk about a use case that I think is useful to think about. And then finally, I'll discuss some future plans that we have for the gateway. So what is a science gateway anyway? I think that there are narrow and wide definitions for what constitutes a science gateway, a couple of different definitions that are floating out there. A narrow definition might require a science gateway to manage user identities, just what I have listed there, record computational experiments as digital objects, save and reuse digital objects, and share with collaborators. But a wider definition might simply be to bring science to a website and a web portal, plus some of the characteristics that are described above. At the very least, I think components of the science gateway should work together to achieve some outcome that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think all gateways must promote fair data principles, the fair data principles that we cherish and hold dear here as part of the ESIP community, find, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I am definitely employing the science gateway term in the wider definition of the term. So that's how I will be thinking about what I'm about to present. Let's just set forth some high level goals for ourselves. Uh, the Unidata Science Gateway is about improving time to science, time to learning, and time to instruction. I really want to make life easier for the members of the Unidata community and just help them get to their science faster. Okay, so we'll be talking about a number of these technologies in more detail here in a little bit, but these are the technologies that you're going to find on the Unidata Science Gateway. And again, we'll be exploring these in more detail here. But as, if you're part of the Unidata community, these are technologies that you're probably already familiar with. You know, I know that we're all busy and we don't necessarily have a lot of time to learn new technologies. Well, the Unidata Science Gateway is just really a reinvention of what Unidata 
already has. But with a smattering of additional open source technologies that amplify Unity technology offerings, such as JupyterHub, which we'll be talking about. So again, we'll be talking about these technologies in some detail in the next slides. And with that, let's go into it. So we're going to talk about a little bit about data distribution and how data gets to the science gateway. For those of you who have been in the Unidata community for a while, you'll probably recognize the LDM. The LDM is a peer-to-peer -peer data transfer software employed by universities and research institutes and probably even private companies to distribute and receive large quantities of real-time geoscience data. It's been around for decades and it's very robust, proven, reliable. You can really think of the IDD as an implementation of LDM technology where you can subscribe to, for example, NWS NSEP model forecasts, such as the GFS and the HER and the Jeffs Ensemble, et cetera. You can get next rad radar data, go satellite imagery. We employ the LDM uh, and an LDM relay node on the unit data science gateway to distribute uh, some of this IDD data to a variety of data services that are available on the gateway and we'll be learning more about these shortly. There's about a terabyte and a half a day of data coming through the relay node. So there's quite a bit of real time data that can be made available through the gateway. Okay, members of the ESIP community will probably recognize the Threads data server. The Threads data server provides metadata and data access to scientific data, generally geoscience data. It supports a number of different data access protocols, such as DAP and WMS and HTTP. And in practical terms, I think about how, how the TDS can perform server-side subsetting and aggregations to ship only the data that you're really interested in from usually a client application, like say a Python program or the IDV or something like that, the Unidata IDV. The TDS, of course, is widely employed in the geosciences. So here you have a TDS uh, that you can find on the Unidata Science Gateway. Uh, this is a TDS with IDD similar to the uh, Threads data server that is running in-house on, on, uh, at Unidata, but with a smaller archive, about five days worth of data. You'll find some GFS ensemble data, high resolution rapid refresh data, NAM data, the typical NWS and NSEP model products that you may be familiar with, as well as radar data, satellite data, et cetera. Okay, here's another TDS that you can find running on the Science Gateway. So NO has made its vast archive of NextRed radar data available via the NOAA Big Data Project. Uh, the Big Data Project uploaded this vast archive to, to Amazon and various cloud vendors. And these data are available directly from an S3 uh, data store, but you can also access them from this TDS running on, this, on the Science Gateway that fetches uh, the data from Amazon. Uh, so the TDS here operates as kind of an intermediary to the Amazon S3 store. There are no egress charges because of an internet uh, of an arrangement uh, of an internet two arrangement between Amazon and Indiana University, where the Science Gateway is running. So we'll talk a little bit more about where all this is running here in a moment. And so with this, you will have fami uh, the familiar TDS API that uh, you're f hopefully familiar with to access uh, radar data from Amazon. In addition, we have a Ramada server running on the Science Gateway. Ramada is a geoscience content management system. It was originally developed at Unidata a while back and it is 
still maintained to this day by Jeff McWhorter at Geode Systems, which is just now an independent, and he's been maintaining it for a, at least a decade now. Ramada gives users the ability to upload and store their data. And the really great thing about Ramada is that you can upload a NetCDF file and get the DAP link. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the data access protocol that probably many people in the ESIP community are familiar with for server-side subsetting of the data and whatnot. And I'll be talking a little bit more about Ramada in a use case and a few examples here in a little while. In addition, we have an ADDE Mekitis server running on the gateway. Mekitis stands for the MAN Computer Interactive Data Access System and is one of the oldest scientific software packages in existence. You can kind of tell that just by what the acronym means. I think it's a little bit of an outdated acronym, but anyway. Uh, Mekitis is employed heavily in the satellite data community for analysis and visualization of satellite data. The server side of Mekitis is ADDE, the so-called abstract data distribution environment. And we employ ADDE at Unidata uh, for, uh, for the IDB to visualize geos, uh, uh, GOES data, for example, and also from Mekitis X and Mekitis V clients uh, that can access ADDE. So again, if you're part of the satellite data community, you would you would uh, definitely recognize uh, Mekaitis. We also have an AWIPS EDEX server running on the gateway. Uh, AWIPS, of course, is the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. It's employed heavily at the National Weather Service Forecast Office. And EDEX is the server-side component of AWIPS. And here you have the AWIPS CAVE client that accesses the EDEX server. And EDEX constitutes a, just a very large part of our, of our science gateway and our Jetstream allocation. Uh, and I, I've been talking about Jetstream a little bit here and I'll, I'll describe in more detail what Jetstream is in a few slides. Okay, so that's uh, AWIPS. So a word about a Docker technology and Docker containerization technology. We have containerized many of the Unidata technology offerings, the TDS, the LDM, Ramada, ADDE, which I was just describing. We employ uh, Docker also on the Jupyter Hub servers, which I'll be talking about in a moment. And we did those containerization efforts independently of the Science Gateway and just live independently from it, or they are just maintained separately, but we leverage extensively from them. And I think the expression here is that we, you, we eat our own dog food. We, we leverage uh, the technology that we develop in-house, which is what you want to see. Okay, so a few under the hood details here. All the resources uh, here are running on the NSF Jetstream Cloud at Indiana University, which is an NSF sponsored uh, cloud computing platform. It runs the OpenStack cloud operating system. You can fire VMs and virtualize infrastructure like networks, subnets, et cetera. Jetstream stands in contrast to public clouds like the Amazon cloud or the Google cloud or the Microsoft Azure cloud, those, those public clouds are those publicly traded clouds. Uh, we, we, again, we leverage a number of open source technologies like Docker and JupyterHub and Kubernetes, which allows you to think about your uh, cloud or your data center as one abstract resource and kind of uh, expand ex elastically into that uh, into that data center. Again, we leverage these open source technologies to amplify Unidata technology offerings on uh, on the Jetstream cloud and on the Science Gateway. Okay. Moving on to Jupyter Hub, being part of the ESIP community, I will assume that you have at least heard of or probably seen a Jupyter Notebook in action. 
And then uh, Jupyter Hub is kind of the server side component of that. It's, it's a multi-user notebook server where users can gain can log in and have access to a workspace where they can run their Jupyter Notebooks, often with pre-configured environments where they don't have to install any software. And indeed, we do that on the Science Gateway. The, the user just logs in and goes and runs their notebooks without having to install any, uh, any difficult to install software. For example, we may have Python environment that would be necessary to do atmospheric science containing such Python libraries as NumPy, Matplotlib, Cartify, the Unidata MetPy library, Pandas, and XArray. These are uh, hopefully familiar to you if you've done any Python visualization and analysis in this uh, domain. And again, we pre-install and pre-configure these uh, environments on the user's behalf. Okay, very good. And we'll see a demonstration of this in a little while. Oh yeah, and yeah, so these can be, these Jupyter Hubs can be pre-populated with GitHub repositories that the user may be interested in. And yes, we'll, we'll see an example here shortly. Okay, as part of the Unit Data Science Gateway, I deploy many Jupyter Hubs. I may make the bold statement that I may administer more Jupyter Hubs than, than anyone. I don't know if that's actually true, but it wouldn't surprise me because I deploy and run many of these on the Unit Data Science Gateway. Uh, I did a number of these recently due to the COVID-19 crisis where I was helping uh, faculty transition their online learning uh, or, or transition to online learning. We've done Jupiter Hubs for the University of Hawaii, Valpo University. These are all MET departments, meteorology departments at these universities, the University of Oklahoma, the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I helped the head of the MET meteorology department there set up some uh, Jupiter Hub online classrooms. And at uh, the University of Northern Colorado, I've been assisting uh, so a uh, professor there. In addition, we've had we've deployed Jupiter Hubs for the U.S. Naval Academy, a Python learning class that they have there. Uh, at Southern Arkansas University, we've done several Jupiter Hubs there for our data science classes in conjunction with Keith Mall here at UCAR in the UCP. Uh, I've done another one for uh, Notre Dame of Maryland University for our physics class there. And it's just a lot of fun setting up these Jupyter Hubs for these professors. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a high degree of job satisfaction in being able to help these people uh, get through their instructional material in these kind of challenging times and moving to online learning. Hopefully we'll see a few more of these logos here uh, with the University of North Carolina, Charlotte coming online here shortly as well as Mississippi State all running under the Science Gateway umbrella. In addition, we've done these Jupyter Hubs for a number of different workshops at AMS, uh, the American Meteorological uh, Society meeting in Boston this past January. Uh, we had 140 students logged into a Jupyter Hub. Uh, all uh, being able to follow along with the instructor, instructor and uh, experiment with what the instructor was demonstrating. Uh, we've done these for regional workshops at uh, the University of Oklahoma and at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. So lots of Jupyter Hubs, all customized for whatever the audience is trying to achieve. So they're all a little bit different in their own way, but they've all been pre-configured so that the students can uh, get up and running immediately without having to install software. They just go to their notebooks and, and get things running uh, immediately. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about a little bit about jupyterhub.unidata.ucar.edu, which is our canonical Jupyter Hub 
server. It has the Unidata Python training project, which has a, a plethora of Python with atmospheric and oceanic uh, sciences notebooks that are just available and ready for you to run immediately uh, with the required environment already set up. And uh, you'll find Jupyter Lab available, which is this new user interface in the Jupyter space uh, that uh, is more modern and hopefully more convenient and more feature rich, especially. So with that, I'm actually gonna go over to our Jupyter Hub server. Um, okay. Okay, very good. So we are at, uh, actually, no, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Okay, very good. So, uh, okay, so here's an example of our Jupyter Hub server, and I'm going to talk about one particular notebook that's gonna be of interest to us. And here is the Python training that is available to you immediately after you log in. I'm kind of zooming in here to make sure you can see that. Uh, these other projects are will not be available to you. I just uh, installed them in my environment when I was experimenting with stuff for uh, some professors that I was helping. And you will see this README first as well, and I encourage you to read that if you log into the server where it gives some useful information. But anyway, we're going to do a demonstration uh, of a Go16 a True Color Recipe notebook. So in order to find that notebook, you kind of need to uh, dive into this file system right here, the Python training project. And, and here you'll find a number of different directories and it's the pages directory that we're interested in. And here there, uh, you'll, under these directories, you'll find a number of different uh, Python notebooks. And it's actually the gallery that we're interested in and here you're going to find just a ton of different notebooks these are going to have to be I think uh, organized in some better way because there's uh, so many of them now these are contribute co community contributed uh, notebooks by professors and Unidata staff has developed some of them the one that we're looking at right that we're going to be looking at right now was developed by Brian Blaylock who was a University of Utah graduate student uh, who's now in Monterey I believe but anyway, let's uh, talk about this Go16 True Color Recipe Notebook. Okay, so this is a notebook that will amalgamate uh, data from the Go16 uh, satellite data to create true color imagery. And there's a lot of code in this notebook. And I actually folded the code on purpose because I didn't want to get that bogged down in a bunch of code. But uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, we're hitting uh, the Ramada server that we were talking about earlier. So we moved some data uh, from Amazon to Ramada, some canned data sets uh, that are coming out of the uh, big weather project at NOAA that's transferring a ton of uh, Go16 data to Amazon. We grab some uh, canned data or some data sets from Amazon and move them to Ramada so that they could be served out from there. And this is just to illustrate how uh, components of the Science Gateway are kind of working together to achieve some end. So again, I folded a bunch of code on purpose here because I didn't want to get bogged down and a bunch of code and just kind of highlight a few salient examples. Okay, and just a minute here. Okay, very good. Okay, so this notebook will render these pretty images from the Go16 data that's been amalgamated from different channels to achieve this true color imagery. And you can see these pretty pictures of this hurricane hitting the coast of Florida. And we're uh, composing different channels to achieve this uh, true color imagery. Uh, here is a larger image of that uh, plot that we were just looking at. This whole, we employ the Cardiffy library here as well as the metpy library and a number of different python libraries that you're uh, that you may be familiar with if you work 
in this space, uh, we reproject the data with uh, the Cartopy library uh, moving to, I believe that's economic uh, projection. Uh, and the notebook goes on, it does some true color imagery over the state of Utah because that's where the graduate student was from the one that originally wrote this notebook. And the notebook goes on to generate these blends, these blends of true color imagery and night IR imagery, uh, which are kind of interesting. And we have a few of those uh, demonstrated in this notebook as well. Finally, we do some mesoscale scans or mesoscale plots of mesoscale scans of uh, GO16 data, the mesoscale sectors, for example, for this uh, hurricane that's uh, hitting the coast or at least skimming the coast of North Carolina. Okay, and then finally, this notebook ends with uh, the GOES 16 true color full disk imagery. So just a, a note here, I actually ran this notebook ahead of time before the call because I, I, I didn't want to have any glitches, glitches or pauses during the demonstration of this notebook. But you can log in and uh, go down into the directory structure and access this notebook and run it for yourself. and uh, it should all work uh, at any rate. Okay. Okay, so that's that GO16 imagery notebook that I wanted to demonstrate. Okay, very good. In addition, we have this other project here that uh, I that you will not find by default uh, in at this Jupyter Hub. I actually had to clone the project and install the project. And at this point, I want to point out a really cool feature of Jupyter and Jupyter Lab. And so I'm going to click on this plus symbol right here, which is going to give me access to this dashboard. And I'm going to fire up a terminal and I just want to illustrate that you have a terminal capability within this Jupyter and, uh, and this Jupyter Hub environment, which is really great because, for example, you have access to your Git utilities and anything that you can do from a command line, uh, you can uh, access via this terminal, which is just wonderful. Uh, I've, and I was able to install a, an environment to run this notebook server in an environment that's not present by default in the Jupyter Hub server. And I'm not gonna go into detail about that because it's all explained in this README first notebook about how you can install your own custom environments for whatever you're trying to do in case the default environment is not satisfactory for what you're trying to achieve. The instructions on installing your custom environments are available in that README first notebook. Okay. So this is uh, just, again, highlighting how different components of the Science Gateway can work together. We're hitting that uh, Threads Next Rad server that I was uh, describing earlier in the talk, uh, and it's accessing that data to do some analysis and visualization of radar data with the PyArt Python library that was a special library that I had to install to run this notebook. Uh, eventually, uh, without getting into a lot of detail here, without uh, getting bogged down into, in any code, we'll eventually generate uh, some radar imagery plots. Okay, so that's a demonstration of our Jupyter Hub server. Very good. Okay, at this point in the talk, I want to talk a little bit about a use case. I'm going to go back into presentation mode. Okay, so we talked about Go16, we talked about this notebook. Okay, I've been working with Ben Schenkel at the University of Oklahoma, and Ben wanted to work with this data set on Jupyter. And so we tried to upload his data set to Jupyter, but we immediately ran into problems with the with an upload size limitation that Jupyter was 
uh, presenting us with. And we got around that pretty easily with some configuration, but we were still get, having problems with really slow upload times for this data set. So I told Ben, well, why not just uh, upload your data to Ramada? Because once it's up on Ramada, you'll be able to get uh, the DAP link. And you'll be able to share that DAP link with all your colleagues and students that you're instructing. And so they won't have to upload the data set. It'll just have to be uploaded once on Ramada. You can get the DAP link, you can share the DAP link, and then you can uh, leverage all the wonderful capabilities that DAP enables for you, like uh, server-side subsetting and whatnot. Uh, so I thought that that was just kind of an instructive use case of how Science Gateway components can work together, in this case, Ramada and the Jupyter Hub working together to achieve some outcome. The resources that we've been talking about today are all available on that URL, uh, which I will also have at the end of the presentation so that you can make a note of it. Uh, there's uh, some uh, news about upcoming and past conferences and just uh, what's going on with the Science Gateway. You can find news information there. You can find all the resources that I've been talking about uh, described on this web page. Uh, etc. So uh, go to that URL if you would like to find out more about what uh, what is available and what we're doing and what is forthcoming. I want to point out that there's also a Science Gateway plugin for the Integrated Data Viewer, which maybe some of you are familiar with, the Unidata Integrated Data Viewer. It's called the Jetstream plugin, but that's really a misnomer. I'm trying to move away from the Jetstream brand and move more towards the Gateway brand for all our technology offerings on the Science Gateway. Uh, and this plugin uh, gives you access to the TDS, Ramada, and ADDE servers that we are running on the, the Jetstream cloud if you are an IDV user. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about technical debt at this point. So we're really, again, as I've been saying over the course of this talk many times now, uh, we've really just been reusing Unidata technology to a great extent, plus we're uh, leveraging an, uh, additional open source technologies, such as Jupyter, Docker, Kubernetes, all the technologies that I've described during this talk. But I'm not writing much code at all, which is great. Uh, I'm not incurring a lot of technical debt. My time is spent documenting. I spend a lot of time uh, configuring Jupyter Hubs to tailor it to certain audiences. I do write a little bit of Docker files and bash scripting. I spent a lot of time troubleshooting and reporting problems to my colleagues and collaborating via GitHub issues, but there's really very little new code development here. So we're not on the hook for just an infinite amount of technical debt or unbounded technical debt, which I think is great. Okay. So future plans for the Science Gateway, uh, there's going to be a, um, an artificial intelligence uh, for Earth System Science Summer School at UCAR. This summer, of course, that's been moved online. So at this point, I think anyone can participate. And I would like to incorporate uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning capability in this gateway to really uh, make true use of cloud capability to uh, do uh, big data analysis. Uh, using machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies that we're all hearing about quite a bit these days. Okay, at this point, I want to acknowledge a few people. I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborator, Andrea Zonka at the San Diego Computing Center, who's just a wonderful person to work with, as well as Jeremy Fisher at Indiana University. These are the kind of colleagues that you want to have in life, just uh, you know, super responsive uh, with issues, and it just really enables us to make a very rapid progress uh, towards our goals. There are some DOIs, if you would like to make a note of those. We've been using uh, the uh, extended collaborative support services 
uh, the ECSS services at Exceed. Uh, if you're familiar with that, that's uh, really great to be able to uh, leverage what those folks have to offer. That's how I'm getting some of Andrea Stein. And yep, great, great group of people to work with right there, Jeremy and Andrea. Okay, and then finally, this is the uh, the, our, the Unidata Granting uh, Agency uh, information. Of course, we're funded by the NSF under that grant. And at that point, that kind of wrapped things up for me. And uh, there is that uh, Science Gateway URL. And I'm ready to take any questions from the audience if uh, anybody would like to do so. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Julian. You have a couple of people that were trying to get into the Jupyter Hub and getting forbidden errors. Um, do you okay, yeah, so, want to speak to what, what access requirements there are? Yes, indeed, there are. Um, there are access requirements. And I believe if, if you ran into those problems, there should be a message at the top there that says, to email me or at, actually at support gateway at unidata.unidata.ucard.edu. Uh, unidata and uh, you should see that email when you try to access that Jupyter Hub. Uh, and if you send an email to that, I'll whitelist you. Uh, we unfortunately are having two whitelist users. We actually had a situation uh, recently where. Uh, where uh, we had some misuse of of Jupyter Hub resources, where somebody was actually trying to mine cryptocurrencies, and so I had that much open before, but I'm having to whitelist users now uh, in order to uh, not have that happen. Uh, so you can you can indeed uh, gain access to that Jupyter Hub uh, if you just uh, email that uh, support email that should be right there. Uh, when you access the Jupyter um, uh, URL. Thank you. Uh, so I'll un unmute the one person I did earlier. And if anybody has questions, um, we are open for business. Trying to get my chat window open as well. Okay. Any questions? Hey, Julian, this is Rich, uh, Rich Signal. Oh, hi, Rich. Hey. Um, hi. So you mentioned you. Um, or debrand, sort of debranding a little bit from uh, Jetstream. Is that because you're um, thinking you may move this gateway at some point in the future to, you know, the commercial cloud or something like that? Or uh, not so much. I just, it's not so much moving away from the Jetstream brand. It's more towards moving uh, towards a comprehensive gateway brand. I think I think it makes more sense to decouple. Uh, to move towards that brand and decouple the in, uh, from the implementation technology. I mean, ultimately, who cares where this is running? Although uh, obtaining Jetstream resources has been really wonderful. Uh, that's just an implementation detail, and it just makes more sense, I think, to move towards a gateway brand. Okay. Yeah. And one follow-up question: Are these um, are these Jupyter Hubs DAS enabled? Okay. No. Oh, well, okay. So uh, the canonical Jupiter Hub that I was displaying right now, that may or may not be true. You and I have done experiments with this, and we've actually gotten that working uh, in the past, right? I mean, like a year, year and a half ago. Um, right. So I actually don't know <laughs> off the okay. top of my head if we could get that okay. running. But however, we could spin off uh, a dedicated Jupiter Hub. Uh, to do DASC style computation. Moreover, on Jetstream, there are, I believe, uh, VMs that have uh, 
GPU access. So we could fire up a Jupyter Hub uh, that would have a GPU enabled VMs working behind the scenes. And I'm actually really eager to try to get that working, especially as we enter into this machine learning and AI uh, regime. Uh, so that would be really neat to, to try to get that working. I'm hoping to, to perhaps get that working uh, this summer for the, the, the workshop that's going to be hosted at NCAR. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, I just, I, yeah, that sounds cool. I, um, I, I just remembered, I think I remember Andrea Zonka posting some, you know, on his stuff on his blog about how he had the DAS Kubernetes stuff singing or something finally. Um, let's see, I'm scrolling through this. Can someone post the, so can someone copy and paste the, the support email that's listed on the Jupyter Hub uh, page in, in the chat? Because I, I can't get to it because of course I'm already authenticated. Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so if that? anybody wants access, please email me and I'll grant you access. And you will need, by the way, a GitHub login. Uh, so all this is uh, being done through uh, GitHub OAuth. So we have a, another question in the chat. Stace, I don't know if you just want to pipe up and right. ask that. Or, Hi, okay, I had to oh, okay. How much it's Stace from Withhold Oceanographic. And hi, Julian. I was first congratulating you because of your quick deployment of all those Jupyter hubs for the online learning. That was incredible. Um, and my, my questions are with regard to deploying Jupyter hubs for others to use. And you might not even be able to answer this yet because you just started that. But I'm wondering. Um, from your experience, how much maintenance is needed once you set up a Jupyter Hub? And then how much training do you have to get, like when you're handing one of these off for one of these courses, how much training do you have to give the person you're handing it off to? Okay, great question. So I've gotten actually quite good at uh, minting these. I've really optimized my workflow for uh, minting these out and uh, deploying a number of different uh, Jupyter Hub servers. I do try to have work with a local admin. So for example, at the University of Hawaii, I have, I'm working with somebody there and I'm trying to delegate some of that admin responsibility over to them. And, and admining constitutes really just adding and subtracting users to the Jupyter Hub. I would really prefer not to, to do that. I would like to delegate that responsibility over to those users. Uh, beyond that, when you know when you do some customization, like when you want like a particular GitHub repository to, to be available for some user, then yes, I do need to be involved in that. So to answer your question, it's really a mixture of approaches where I try to delegate uh, what I can, where I can, with uh, my local point of contact. But then there's some unavoidable uh, customization that I do have to get involved in. Though I have to say that I've gotten, I've really streamlined my workflow and I've really gotten really good at, at, uh, at minting these out uh, pretty quickly. Once, once they're out in the open, they don't necessarily require that much uh, maintenance. Uh, although some, some of my users have been reporting problems like Kevin at Valparaiso University, uh, a colleague that I have there has been reporting problems with uh, the Jupyter Hub, for example, uh, mounting the disk volumes that are associated with people's workspaces. That doesn't always work 100% of the time. So I've had to address some issues there. But, you know, so, so to answer your question, it's kind of a mixture of, uh, you know, I just let them run with it where I can, but I do need to get involved uh, every once in a while. Cool. So another question I had was recently I've been getting a lot of mileage out of um, a little Jupyter plugin called JupyText. Um, mm. Have you gotten that working or are you playing with it at all? No, I don't know about JupyText. Can you uh, talk about it a little bit? So it, um, 
it allows you to use an R markdown file, which you can run Python or R in the, the chunks of the file. But the, the selling point is that you, um, you can check the markdown file into source and um, track it in a much nicer way than an IPy notebook. Um, anyways, I, it's, it's been a really cool piece of tech because you, when, you, when you render the R markdown, you just generate an HTML file that you don't necessarily check in, but you can save as kind of a log of your run. Um, and I was just curious if you'd seen it or played with it or installed it. Could, it's, no, it's, uh, I, I, yeah. I don't know about that, but I just want to point out that, so it's a, it's a Jupyter Hub extension, right? And I assume that you can still yeah. see my screen. Yeah, we can see here. So under, under, under the, the Jupyter Lab interface, um, you know, it's gotten a good deal more complicated, but one, one of the options is to enable this extension manager. Why don't we just try that right now? Um, <laughs> you know, let's just uh, see what happens. Um, it's a fun little piece of tech because it makes your it makes your notebooks makes your notebook super friendly to to review and get basically. So we're living a little bit dangerously here because I've actually I haven't used this extension manager in a long time and I actually don't even remember how to use it. But you should be able to uh, install uh, your own extensions. Uh, via this uh, this option, does anybody know how to use it? <laughs> I don't think it's an extension, Dave. Is it? I think it's isn't it a package? No. I don't know exactly. I mean, I installed it in Docker. I don't remember exactly what it's called, honestly. <laughs> I think it is a package, though, that you have to install and oh, then oh. enable. So yeah, I think you kind of install it. Yeah. Okay, and and if it's a conda install, again, you can do that. Okay, you just need to read the the, the README first, and it explains how, how to install your own environments. And there's a couple of tricks that you need in order to get that to work, but it is explained in, in that README. And I just since we were on the top of it, of extensions, we are using one extension called NB Git Puller. And so if it if your uh, Jupyter Hub environment uh, references a GitHub repository, each time you restart the server or if you log in uh, after you've been off for a while, your GitHub repository will be, or your local GitHub repository will be updated according to the remote repository. So that's just really useful in a classroom setting where the material is getting updated. You know, the user, the end user doesn't really need to do anything to get that material. It just happens automatically uh, as that, uh, canonical a uh, github repository gets updated for the student so, so julian so you guys, that's uh, so to, to talk about oh go ahead i'm sorry it's like walkie talkie here but um <laughs> i um so you guys are using jupyter hub for training as opposed to binder Yeah, my experiences with Binder, I mean, not to knock Binder because I think that what they're doing is great, but I mean, here you have, uh, you know, some dedicated resources that are available to you and you're probably going to be granted, and for example, if you're working for a course or some, on a course or something, I'm going to grant you a significantly more uh, amount of CPU and disk usage that you would be able to get on Binder. And uh, theoretically, it should be uh, more reliable than Binder uh, in theory and in practice, be more reliable in Binder because the times when I try to use Binder, sometimes sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So so when you like, if you have 80 users who sign up for some training, do you have to like do you just delete all their accounts afterward, or or delete the whole thing, or how do you how do you manage all that persistent yes. space and stuff? So for the workshop, for the AMS workshop, that's exactly what we did. We we staged a Jupyter Hub server. Uh, we had uh, you know 140 students logged in. Uh, we did not employ persistent volumes, so all their work was just in memory. So if the if the whole thing went south, they would have lost all their work. But I was willing to live with that risk, and that that made things work I think very smoothly because I never had problems with volumes. But anyway, after the workshop was over, you know, I left it up for a little while, but then, and I had the users, uh, if they wanted to download their work, 
Um, but after that, I, I I took it I took it offline. But of course, there's the other avenues for them that I can provide them with the canonical Jupyter Hub server or with a Jupyter Hub server that would run as part of a class at their university. Right. Cool. Well, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, we will stop recording here.